just to give you some introduction and kind of an update on uh, what we've been doing. It's the Newark Valley Historical Society gets established in 1976. And as uh, there were hundreds of other museums of one sort or another got, that was the bicentennial year. And then I like to say that, you know, this is an organization that kind of went on, got on steroids. Uh, I mean, the amount that's been done is really pretty remarkable. So um, um, the house was donated in 1977. It was opened as a living history site in 1980. We have had tours um, every weekend, usually for about three months out of the year, for over 40 years. We've done school tours every year for about that same uh, length of period of time. Um, I was not one of the people that got involved, you know, initially, but I think I went to the first APA festival. And so what I tell people is my life has never been the same. <laughs> um, so, um, and initially we had an acre and a half of land, the house and, and the outhouse. That's all that, you know, we started with. Everything, everything else has been either moved here or uh, reconstructed. So in 1995, the woman that uh, donated the property to us, Murdy Louise Billings Hills, had enough confidence in the society, well, would you like the rest of the farm? <laughs> so, and that's when we acquired 95 acres. Mm -hmm. So we have 18 acres across the creek, mm -hmm. and then uh, we have that entire field over there, about 30 acres of prime farmland. Uh, we lease about 10, 12 acres to a couple soccer clubs. <clears throat> and then we have most of that hillside. Um, and then along about 10 years ago, we had this group that built a bridge across the creek, which was quite an amazing accomplishment <laughs> in and of itself. You know, coming up with a bridge like that, you know, over that uh, span. So we have a mile and a half of ma nature trails. And, um, and one, of, one of our, um, so, so some of the events that we've got, we, we started the Bluebell Day. This will be our third year, that's May 11th. And we're also gonna have a, a black powder encampment. That's called Fred Frolic's, Fred's Frolic, uh, May 18th. Apple Festival is kind of our signature event. That's the first weekend in October. And then along with that, um, at the same time, we had a group that was restoring the North Valley Depot. And that building was in, it had, what the way I describe it, it had one foot in the grave, the other foot was ready to fall in. It was just, you know, one of those abandoned depots that just, you know, wasn't serving any purpose. <clears throat> and so uh, one fellow in particular, Ray Shaver, he grew up, he loved railroads, he grew up next to the depot, and he decided, this is one building we can't lose. Where is so, this, in Speedsville? <clears throat> well, this, this is in the village of North Valley. In, in, in yeah. <clears throat> so uh, I did. I helped out to some degree when they were getting started, um, but that's now now called the Ray Shaver Depot. You know, after you know, because he's the one that was most instrumental in getting the thing uh, restored. <clears throat> they started something called Depot Friday Nights 20 years ago. Um, one of the things that uh, you know, Marsha Keechel, who's kind of taken charge of that. The first Depot Friday night, uh, there was about 14 people that were there, you know, and that included the kitchen help. <laughs> and so now, you know, we have uh, performances every Friday from the first Friday in June to the last Friday in August, and we'll get 200 people <clears throat> when, um, when the weather cooperates. So there's stuff in the back brochures and things, if you want to, you know, join this illustrious organization, we have membership forms. And then also want to um, mention, uh, we have a pretty active guild structure. There's blacksmithing, and we have what they call cooking and guides guild. <coughs> um, Black powder guilds are the most active ones. And then uh, shovels and spindles, they do spinning and weaving. And so there, there is kind of an art guild as well, you know, people that will focus on that. So that's background for the historical society. So one of the standard things, whenever you go hearing a historical presentation in this area, 
uh, the speakers will say, uh, we are on lands formally under the control of whatever indigenous group happened to be here. <clears throat> and uh, normally it's the, they refer to the, the, the six nations of the Hodan, Haudenosaunee. We all grew up <clears throat> calling them the Iroquois. Uh, but that's really a negative term. <laughs> and, you know, across North America, indigenous people say, we want to call ourselves what we call ourselves, not what the white people, our colonizers, have told us. So that's, that's why that's becoming more and more in the um, uh, public domain, so to speak. Uh, the other thing to mention is that the Haudenosaunee were not the first ones that were here. Now, there were no villages of sorts in northern Tioga County, but there was evidence of hunting camps and that type of thing going back 10,000 years. They, they referred to them as Paleo-Indians. You're not really sure if they had an identity of any sort, but the, <clears throat> the first recognized tribe were the Susquehannocks. They got push, pushed out by the Six Nations you know, when the beaver trade became so important to indigenous peoples, and so they went further down into Pennsylvania, <clears throat> and they um, they got really pretty well eliminated by the the equivalent of the the Proud Boys in the mid 1700s, uh, pretty much wiped out. Now they still have a remnant of the Susquehannocks out in Oklahoma, but they're not a federally recognized tribe. And uh, <clears throat> one other environmental thing to mention besides the trails is that I want to highlight is that um, uh, we currently have uh, New York State's uh, the co-champion Shagbark Hickory. So you can kind of see it as you go outside, you know, across the road there. I can tell you more about what, you know, what the big tree registry is. But uh, that's, if there, there's a point system, if two trees are within five points of one another, they're co-champions. So, uh, <clears throat> but it's an impressive tree. It doesn't draw attention to itself because it doesn't have that big a crown spread. But when you get up to the trunk, it's um, it's 175 inches in diameter or circumference. So it's about between four and five uh, feet in in, uh, in diameter. All right. So enough of that. Um, I want to give uh, a bit of an overview of Tioga County history uh, because I think that helps make sense out of where that cemetery fits in and what happened to the to the terrain, um, you know, over the <clears throat> over 200 years that the the, the county uh, has existed. So this gets settled in the 1790s, as much of New York State does. Uh, after the Revolutionary War, and the population and the economy develops pretty steadily right through the Civil War. It was um, uh, spurned on by, <clears throat> you had all this wonderful lumber, so that was one of the things that helped, uh, you know, bring about development, as well as all this new land that was opened up for, uh, for agriculture. And then, when you get right after the Civil War, all of a sudden, it kind of uh, stops as far as development is concerned. It's kind of a, you know, interesting, complicated process. But um, when I was going through the newspapers, uh, and once the railroads got established, the, the local merchants are complaining, people are getting on the train, they're doing their shopping in Elmira and Binghamton. We're losing money. you got to spend your money locally. <laughs> so, how many times have you heard same, that? Same story. Yeah, the same story. So um, there was a, a New York State census right through 1925, which can be really valuable because there's so much that happens in that 10-year time span that's not necessarily going to get into the federal census. And so every five years, Tioga, Tioga County's population would drop right up into the 1920s. <clears throat> And a lot of the drop was these uh, farms off in the hills that just couldn't compete anymore because you had all this produce coming out from the far west and the midwest, transportation rates were low, and, and you know, the, the, the soil wasn't as good, 
and you needed to invest in technology, you know, more and more uh, tractors, equipment, that type of thing. So uh, there's reports of farmland being abandoned by the 1880s. And by the 1890s, people are just abandoning farms. They're just walking away from them. Nobody wants them anymore. <clears throat> of course, once that happens, then nature returns. Now, a lot of the land was really degraded, but nature can heal itself in, in, in amazing ways. So, um, Tioga County's forest cover was down to about 20% in 1870. And it's been increasing, you know, at, uh, at a steady pace, you know, right up to the present day. It kind of stabilizes in the 1920s as far as uh, population. And a lot of that's because we had all these immigrant farmers that came in, along with immigrant workers in general. And that's my Pol here. yeah, that's when my Polish grandparents came in and they bought this rundown hill farm in uh, in East Newark Valley. <clears throat> so the population kind of stays about the same um, right through the Second World War, and then. Um, IBM builds a plant in New Wigo. My father was one of the first people hired there in 1956. So the population of Tioga County uh, doesn't reach the 1870 population until the 1950s. And then it's increased pretty much from there. We're a little over, you know, 51,000, I think, in that range. <clears throat> so, um, How did I find out about um, the graveyard? Now, I, I like to share a couple tidbits of local history. I was about 10 years old. We spent all kinds of time over at my, my grandfather's farm, and I just got wonderful memories, you know, being over there and, you know, when I was old enough to work, you know, help with all kinds of different chores. But my father and my grandfather were joking <clears throat> one time and they're, they're chuckling about something. Of course, they were talk, talking in Polish, so I only got bits and pieces. But all of a sudden, my grandfather makes some reference to the Cuckoo Clan. Mm -hmm. So I said, hmm. <laughs> and so I, I've, I've done a deep dive into clan activity in the southern tier, and I found out that <clears throat> they had burned a cross somewhere near my grandfather's farm. Because, you know, he had three strikes against him. He was Polish, he was Catholic, and he was an immigrant. You know, and uh, those people don't belong here. So, and there were other Polish, Eastern European farmers that got the same uh, treatment. <clears throat> so, um, right about the same period of time, uh, I remember having this conversation with my father, and he said, "You know, sometime I'd like to go to this uh, burial ground where I, where I think, you know, black people are buried." Now, I'm sure. So. It kind of went in one ear and out the other. It says, a, a, a black pe you have black people buried in the state woods, you know, off where, where you grew up? That just didn't make any sense. I had one black guy in my, you know, my graduating class. So, um, but I, I remember the story because it was just so unusual. <clears throat> and my father had gone there like sometime in the 1930s. Now, my cousin said he was uh, chasing down a renegade heifer which is possible, but this is like a good couple miles from my father's farm, so he may have decided, oh, I gotta, hey dad, I, I gotta chase down this heifer, I don't know where it is, and hey, I got a chance to explore the countryside. <laughs> That's possible, but my, my father was a nature lover, so he would go three, four miles in every direction from the farm when he had a chance. <clears throat> so, um, he went back in the 1970s to see if he could locate it. So what do you think had happened, you know, between the 1930s and the 1970s? He grew up like right? grown. Yeah, so you have 40 years worth of forest cover and the landscape had changed significantly. And so he, he wasn't able to locate it, but he said, well, I searched this area, so I'm pretty sure it's located in this part of the the state woods, and he told my cousin, you know, he says, well, I think if you go in this area that this is where you find it. <clears throat> my cousin located it, 
And so right about 1980 is when my cousin showed it to me. My, my father died in 1978. So unfortunately, we never, you know, we're, we got to got to see the place together. So um, it's an area about um, half again as big as this room. There's this broken down stone wall around it, and um, there's uh, there, there's some big depressions in the ground. And uh, at first we thought, well, somebody came here and vandalized the skeletons, which may have happened at least for one of them. But this was the, the family cemetery for the Livermore farm. The last Livermore uh, left in 1910, so they exhumed the family members. They were reburied in Hope Cemetery down here in the village of North Valley. <clears throat> now, there are some field stones that would appear to be headstones, but there's no initials of any sort on them. And so that's basically where, where I started. Um, so my first... Um, uh, thing that I did was I, I talked to all of my father's contemporaries and um, they said, oh, you mean the old Livermore place? You know, and that's one of the things that you, uh, you pick up as far as clues are concerned, you know, as far as, you know, trying to track down the history of an area. So I, um, I know this went back, you know, at least a hundred years, if not, you know, longer than that. So I go to the, the census books and, um, uh, you know, all of a sudden I see these, um, you know, I, I find the, 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 you know, the listing for Livermore and um, in the 1870s they had black field hands. Mm -hmm. So uh, all born in Virginia, apparently they're emancipated slaves that uh, came north after the Civil War. So... <clears throat> This was quite a revelation. I mean, I was just absolutely amazed and thrilled to see this, and um, I was just really curious, you know, about how this, you know, actually came about. So then, um, um, got a couple of it. Oh, here's, here's John. Yeah. Um, uh, one of the things that I did is I, I got curious, you know, is there any other black people you know, in Tioga County. So I'm going through the census book going page by page, and since Tioga County is 99% white, on the column for race, they don't even put, you know, fill that in. But every so often, you'll see B meaning a black person. Okay. Or sometimes M meaning yeah. mulatto. So I'm going through, I'm going through, and um, uh, all of a sudden I come to this, you know, one section of, of a Wego, and half to two-thirds of the page of black people. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm looking at this. Mm -hmm. I says, who are these people? What, what are they doing here? Where did they come from? How, you know, what, 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 what kind of trades do they have? And, and like, well, where did they go? Because they aren't here anymore. <laughs> so uh, let me go to my guide. And, uh, so did it say... N or B? Yeah, it would say, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure it says B, you know, B is black. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. In census books, they were, they, were, they were using that. Yeah, they didn't use N for Negro. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they put in that. So, um, this is, um, this page here, the Atlas of 1869. This is one of the oh. best maps you've got as far as historical data is concerned. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is a, a map that they made in 1853 <clears throat> that you'll see in different places, but it's not readily available. So <clears throat> uh, I've outlined where the Oakley Corner State Forest is, right in the center, and then right in the center that you can see J.M. Livermore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so he was the, he had a, uh, a 500 acre farm there <clears throat> and then the other guy was Oakley. He had another five acre, five hundred acre farm, and that's that's when they created the, the state forest. Mm -hmm. But there was a they, and they referred to that as Oakley Corners. Mm -hmm. You know, <clears throat> just one of those spots in the countryside that got a, a name associated with it. But there was a school there. Uh, further down, you can see carpentry shop, 
and uh, I think a blacksmith shop, and then in the middle of that uh, right. southern part, they had a little shop. So um, that might be right in the middle where the pond is now. There's probably not too much, you know, that, that's its extent there. So one of the things <coughs> that um, uh, <coughs> I, I wish they had was they, they, if they named the roads, but the, but at least you can <coughs> you can look at all the uh, you know if, if there was if there was a home there you know they they, they designate that mm -hmm. and then uh, on the other side this is a, a modern typo map. <coughs> My voice doesn't hold up quite as long as it used to. <laughs> That's pretty steep terrain, isn't it? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, in places. Mm -hmm. And that X there, that's the approximate uh, spot where the, uh, the cemetery is. It's kind of right on the border oh, okay. between, um, you know, North Bell and Oviedo. Huh. Where, where is the Yeah, that's right there. Right here. Mm -hmm. okay. The base of a hill. Well, it's way back in here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here's uh, the next page. This is the, the census for 1870. <clears throat> and it lists uh, Madison Livermore. Uh, he's, he's, he has a wife. He's got uh, two children. And here's the, the far, five field hands. That, um, that were employed there. <clears throat> and apparently, um, so there's, there's, there's four, four men and a woman that's a housekeeper. And apparently he had them staying right in the house with him. So um, many times, you know, a lot of people just wouldn't have allowed that to happen. They would have built a separate structure, you know, a barracks of some sort. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> It would appear that Madison was a pretty, you know, decent individual who had, um, you know, pretty, pretty liberal-minded. Now, 1875, New York State Census, um, he has three blacks there, but they're, they're different, but they're all, all born in Virginia, and then he has a, a white woman that's, that, that's a housekeeper. So on the next page, um, modern highway map. Maybe there's some more orientation, orientation that way. So <clears throat> you have um, Dutch Town, Wade Hollow turns into Dutch Town Road. You know, Wade Hollow starts on 38, goes over to uh, 38B. And there's a state lands road that actually goes all the way down you know, much further than that, you know, where the crossroads is. And then um, the next page, this, this is a more of a modern trail map. Now, they, <clears throat> this is pretty much the, way, the outline of the trail, itself, although they, they named it differently. So you can see where that state lands road takes a, a t sharp turn to the left. And then trail number 13 is actually, they call it B5 now. Okay. And um, so these are roads or, or trails? Yeah, yeah, the dotted lines are trails. Okay. So the, but, but the solid line is a, is a road. What's that? The solid line is a road. Yeah, that's a road. Okay. Now it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a rough road. Yeah. You know, um, if you have a car that rides low to the ground, you, you, it, it's best not to drive on there. Yeah. <laughs> but with an SUV or a pickup truck, okay. you know, it's fine. <laughs> So, um, once I found out that all you know, we had all those people there in um, uh, you know the village of Oigo, I just got curious about Black history in general. Sure. So, um, one of the areas that I've uh, been quite fascinated by and spent a lot of time is one particular aspect: ethnic immigrant minority groups. Now, part of the reason is that I fit in that category. I was raised as a Polish Roman Catholic. <laughs> so, 
you know, I kind of have uh, s some interest, you know, personally in that way. And African Americans, I, I remember from high school, you know, I remember when Malcolm X was assassinated, you know, and we're reading about him, just the you know, civil rights struggle going on, you know, while I, while I was in school. So that, that's been an interest for, for a very long time. Newark High School, is that where you went? Yeah, yeah, I went to Newark, yeah, I graduated in 19, 1965. <clears throat> So then I just started, you know, finding out, well, what, what can I learn about, you know, all these people, um, you know, that fit the African-American category in Tioga County. So one of the things I like to do is um, come up with an estimate of when you think the, the first person of color with, uh, that you can document in, in the southern tier. So how far back do you think those people were uh, wandering the hills? A long time. Yeah, long time. Yeah, you're right there. <laughs> and, um, down in uh, Barton, Barton was named after a black person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh -huh. and my my wife's daughter lives on Niger Hollow. Right, right. I know exactly what you're talking about, yeah. And uh, I found a cemetery down there where... Uh, I think ninety percent of the people are are black. Well, mm. Yeah, that was a because community. That was a community down there. Mm -hmm. That was a community. Apparently, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. But yeah. but this cemetery down there is. Uh, I can take it to it. I forget. I can't give you any instructions because I forgot. But anyway, uh, uh, the names there are are. Well, what I call black names. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you get from here? How do you get down there, Eugene? Mm -hmm. How do you get to that cemetery from where we are right now? Uh, you gotta go down that way, of course. Yeah. And, so. and then you, when you get down to uh, in Wigo, you gotta gotta make a make a right hand turn. Yeah, yeah, gotta go 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 west. Well, and and so. but now, I, I guess there's a name of uh, there's a there's a town there named Barton, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. Well, the the town of Barton is the the, the west end of town. Right. I, yeah, yeah I, I definitely would like to see That's, that. So. Yeah. Hey, I'll show you something you want to see. Okay, yeah, right. You know what? If, if someday I'd like to arrange when, when the weather gets better to get Daryl Denning, who I just yeah. mentioned before the mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Daryl Denning is a part of our Veterans for Peace group, and he feels that he has relatives who are slaves who are probably uh, oh, yeah. in turn buried somewhere around here. He would love to come down if, if we could find that grid just to look for the names. Yes, I, know, you know? I, I don't know quite where the cemetery is, but I know those, that area back in there. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it was Niger Hollow, but yeah. not, they changed it. They, they Niger, changed it over. Niger right. Hollow. Yeah. yeah. Right, right. <laughs> and so that, that's one indication that, oh, all right. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, I mean, it was, a, and then that term for, for many years was just, as, oh, you know, you're, you're a, you know, normal black person, you know, yeah. blue collar, you yeah. know, and uh, it wasn't necessarily yeah. meant, you know, to be that's the extreme right. insult, you know, that it was, uh, on a, 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 you know, the, her, it came later. her daughter, I, I don't know where she went, but anyway, uh, she was talking to this black person there, and uh, the black person wanted to know where she lived, and uh, she was hesitant to say uh, that, that she lived on Niger College. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But uh, there was no incident. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So anyway, the first reference to a black person that you can document is 1753. Wow, before the Revolution War. Yeah. Now, it goes back further than that. Um, uh, the first, uh, I'll probably get this all wrong, but, uh, and I can't remember the names either, but they came out of Albany and they had a black person with them. And of course, uh, he's, he's a celebrity more or less because, you mm -hmm. know, he's black and all the Native American women, they, I mean, I shouldn't say this in front of, but anyway, uh, <laughs> Oh, what's he that? Was a <laughs> what's that? Wow, yeah. wow, wow, wow. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, I might, I might have some hit one into me. I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, it's just a theory of mine. But well, you, you know, because you, you, you can, you can take DNA now. You know, mm -hmm. for, yeah, yeah, I don't believe in that. That crap. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, <clears throat> the way um, uh, I had found this reference, you know. Uh, from, from this other guy that kind of dove into uh, obscure history of Tioga County, but um, the Moravian mi missionaries, yeah. yeah, they came up from Pennsylvania, right. 
they were proselytizing among the Onondaga. Now, the, a, a lot of missionaries, you know, uh, were horrible people oh, because they just wanted to come in, said, you know, you people are Satanists, you're, you're, you're yeah, worshiping yeah. something that's absolutely wrong. We, we need to, you know, we need to give you the white man's religion, religion, <laughs> and the sooner you forget you're Native American, the better off you're going to be. The Moravians didn't do that. No, they they came up through. Uh, they would live among the the natives. They would learn their language. Some of these people uh, came up with an alphabet. They translate the Bible. I mean, the the intellectual abilities of some of these people are just phenomenal. So, uh, in the area of Otsunigo, in, in this journal that a couple of the, the missionaries wrote, said, we came across the black person, and we, we asked him for, uh, for, for directions, and he said he'd been living among the natives, so it, we can document 1753. Now, he may have been an actual African, uh, because when... Uh, the slaves came here, if they were able to escape, they weren't going to swim back to Africa. They just ran off into the woods. Yeah. These were tough people, and so a lot of Native American tribes gave them uh, sanctuary. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that's as much as I know about the person. So slavery existed in all 13 colonies. Um, by 1800, it had pretty much been eliminated in most of New England as well as Pennsylvania because of the influence of the Quakers. Uh, Pennsylvania was uh, kind of ahead of the game as far as you know eliminating slavery. New York State and New Jersey had, uh, I mean, New York State in particular, they had the highest slave population uh, in 1790 you know, amongst uh, anything north of the Mason-Dixon line. So the process <clears throat> of eliminating slavery was just a really arcane, complicated one. Uh, and it, you know, slavery was guaranteed in the Constitution. You know, for most people, it says it's perfectly fine to consider another person's property. Yeah. So you kind of have to put yourself in the mindset of, of that uh, particular time period. And um, you're taking away a person's property, yeah. you know, when you're saying that slavery is wrong, you know, in any way, shape, or form. So, 1799, New York State pass, passes a law for gradual emancipation. It only applied to the children of people that were enslaved at on July 4th, 1799. Okay. And, uh, but the children had to, uh, if you were female, you had to stay until you were age 25. If you were male, you had to stay until you are age 28. And then the slave owners would get compensation from the New York State. Mm -hmm. So it was what you needed to do to get that legislation through. Now, 1817, they finally said, okay, July 4th, 1827, everybody's going to be, you know, eliminated, you know, as far as being a slave. But that, that took a while. It, it took a lot of lobbying. It took a lot of work. You know, it was one of those social justice things that was, you know, quite a struggle. So July 4th, 1827, but there were still some blacks that were indentured. So mm -hmm. it didn't eliminate it completely, but, it, you know, we, we, we came, uh, you know, pretty close. Um, and uh, for many, many years, uh, New York State uh, African Americans would have uh, big celebrations. And usually they have it on July 5th, you know, not to coincide with, you know, July 4th, which was the, the you know, Independence Day for the United States. And there were, there were some really amazing programs that were put together uh, for that. So. The other thing I want to include is that there's kind of some highlights of African American history in Tioga County, <coughs> which are significant nationally, not just as kind of interesting pieces of local history. Uh, the African American population was strong enough that they established a church in Wego. 
African Methodist Episcopal Church, mm -hmm. founded in 1842, and it lasted for over a hundred years. And you know, when I was going through newspaper accounts, you know, they were listed along with all the other parishes. Um, they had a choir. They would have fundraisers. You know, the whole nine yards. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> And then um, when you get into the 1830s, 1840s, there's this um, surge of social justice movements that get started. I mean, it was like the oh. 1960s. You know, abolitionist um, societies, they're springing up like mushrooms all over the country. Uh, women's rights, Seneca Falls is 1848. Uh, some of the initial labor uh, unions get formed, the education reform, um, some of the, you know, trying to look at you know, treating people with mental illness in a more humane way. I mean, it's, it all happens in that, you know, 10, 20 year time period. So um, there's an abolitionist society that gets formed. Um, it's, it's the American Anti Slavery Society. It gets formed in January of 1840. And throughout the North, many of these societies that get formed, you know, many of the local population, they're not happy. And there's nothing in the local newspapers, but from the history of the Baptist Church, which was one of the centers for abolitionist activity, they said there was an angry mob when they were actually going to form. You know, they, they threw rocks, broke the windows. And the, the people in that time period said, we were afraid for our physical safety. And, and many abolitionists were attacked physically. Some of them got killed. You know, that's the, the, the amount of um, hostility that so many people in the North had to the idea of, you know, eliminating slavery in, in, in the country. Was that locally also? Matt? What's that? Was that happening? Yeah. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yeah. So... Um, <clears throat> There's all kinds of homes in Owego in particular that they think were um, uh, places where enslaved people were, were given asylum or, or given assistance. And you have a whole gamut as far as abolition is concerned. There are many people who said, yes, you know, it's wrong to treat another person as property, but I'm not really going to do anything personally to help that along. Or I'll, I'll help, you know, an abolitionist society, I'll be a member, I'll provide some money, you know, that mm -hmm. type of thing. And then you had the other people that, you know, they were they were ready to help an enslaved person. And you gotta remember they were breaking the law. They were risking getting fined, perhaps thrown in jail. <clears throat> so you, you gotta take that into account. Um, the fellow that has the most the best pedigree for being a station master is a fellow by the name of Hammond Penny. Oh, he, yeah. he lived on uh, Front Street in Owego. He was one of the founders of the Abolitionist Society. He um, uh, connected with people at the national level. He was friends with Frederick Douglass. He was friends with Garrett Smith. He was actually on the Liberty Party um, platform when they when they were actually you know on, on office. Was he a black man? No, no, he was white. He was a merchant in Wego. Okay. And um, was that Penny or Penny? Penny, P-I-N-N-E-Y. Mm -hmm. And then, um, oh, when the home gets sold, Penny's children say, you know, we remember enslaved people coming here, you know, and being given uh, assistance. When the uh, the anti-slavery society disbands in 1870. Because the Thirteenth Amendment has been passed, Fourteenth Amendment has been passed, so <clears throat> we're no longer necessary. The newspaper account says that it's more than suspected that Hammond Penny gave assistance to fugitive slaves coming through mm -hmm. Wego. <laughs> so it's like, well, you know, all right, C can't you go the the next step here? <laughs> but then he he dies in 1898. And um, uh, there were two newspapers in the Wego at the time, the Wego Times and the Wego Gazette. And in his obituary, this is, he was a station master. They mm -hmm. just pinpointed very specifically. <clears throat> the other thing 
is that um, um, yeah, kind of lost my my, uh, my my train of thought here. <laughs> um, oh, there's documentation of an enslaved person coming through a widow in uh, 1854, and that's very rare. Yeah. So it was on. It, it was one of these things. As I'm going through the newspapers, <clears throat> there was a, a, a small article, <clears throat> and it said Underground Railroad. Mm -hmm. And and this story was was really remarkable in a number of ways. Um, uh, it was it was a man that came through with his with with his son, who was a child, mm -hmm. and that's that's one other thing that's really rare. Now he. He told his story, you know, to somebody in the, in the locally that uh, I think it was, well, he didn't say where he was from, but, you know, just he was a slave. But I, I had a master that was a sadist. He beat me on a regular basis for no reason whatsoever. And he actually was blind in one eye mm -hmm. because that happened from one of the beatings. Mm -hmm. Kind of resigned that this man's going to kill me one of these days, you know, why I deserve this fate, I, I had no idea. It just said, I, I just have to accept it for one reason or another. But then he found out that his master was planning on selling his child. And so he said, I can't let that happen. And, and he made it as far as a widow. Mm -hmm. We don't know what happened after that. No, don't know what happened after that. Now, Frederick Douglass... Uh, you know, one of the things he says, don't publicize runaway slaves in the North mm -hmm. because the slaves can't read. Yeah. They're not going to find out about this. And this is just going to make slave owners more, you know, angry and radical. <laughs> but he did publish the story in, in the North Star. Mm -hmm. You know, so he did, he did say that. So that, that's one of the things that says, okay, we can prove the Underground Railroad went to Owego, you know, by that oh, yeah. alone. Oh, yeah. And a lot of the maps that you see for the Underground Railroad don't show it going through Owego. Oh, is that right? It goes from Montrose to Elmira, Montrose mm -hmm. to Binghamton, you know, and then from Elmira to Ithaca. <clears throat> so that's one of the things that hopefully will get corrected. The other uh, story that is of, the, of national significance is... Um, uh, there was an Oigo barber who got on the train and he went to Elmira with his wife and um, sister-in-law. And then from there he was going to get on the what they called the, Jeff the Elmira to Jefferson Railroad. Now, for, for a long time he said, you know, wh where is this Jefferson? And that's the old name for Watkins Glen. Okay. Um, and okay, so they're going to go sense. there, and then they're going to take a, 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 a packet boat up um, Seneca, Seneca Lake. Lake. <clears throat> now, it happened in the time of the year where they, they might have been going to a Fourth of July celebration for emancipation, you know, at the north end of the lake. So they get off the Erger Railroad in Elmira, and they get on the Elmira to Jefferson Railroad, and um, he had a first class ticket. He was a barber. So he was kind of like a middle class person, and uh, the conductor comes up to him and says, you know, we have another place for you to sit, you know, you're not supposed to sit here. And um, the guy's name was Richard Thompson, and he said, well, I'm very comfortable here, you know, I'm not going to move. I, I don't see any reason why I should move. <clears throat> and so the next thing that happens, this gets reported in the paper, that the conductor along with two of the brakemen had to forcibly remove him from his seat. Mm -hmm. Like Gandhi here, and moved from the train. Huh? <laughs> yeah. So uh, there was a, a bunch of complications that, that got involved, but they eventually did um, make it to uh, you know Jefferson Watkins Glen at, at the time. But when he gets back to Owego, see there was there was no law saying that um, uh, being black meant you had to sit in a different you know, no. a car, railroad car one, so, of one sort or another. So he took the railroad to court, oh, yeah. and he won damages. Yeah, wow. So this is a hundred years before wow. Rosa Parks. Before Rosa. 
Yeah. Now, uh, uh, there were, uh, you know, Frederick Douglass, and there was another guy I'll mention, David Ruggles, who was uh, a, a, a really prominent black abolitionist and civil rights leader from New York City. They were fighting discrimination on public transportation in that time period. Um, uh, David Ruggles got the same kind of treatment, and he took the railroad to court for assault. Now, I haven't been able to find out what his, um, you know, when he took the railroad to court, if he said, <clears throat> as, as a black person, I have the right to sit where I want, you know, as long as I'm not bothering anybody, sure, sure. you know, and uh, not causing a disturbance. Uh, and if that's the case, that, that's, uh, it could be the first time <clears throat> public transportation was challenged on race in American history. But I have been able to find it. a little more on that, right? For next, especially okay. Black History Month. That yeah. would be a great um, article. It's, it's an amazing you story. Can, yeah. you can yeah. get now, the I went to the Shimong County Historical Society, and it was reported in the Elmira papers. And so <clears throat> what the railroad said was that, you know, we have people, you know, that feel more comfortable sitting among their own, and so we have the right to move our passengers around based on, you know, how our people, you know, want, want the railroad to be, how, how we want co uh, customers to be conducted. So that was their, that was their yeah, defense. Their argument, yeah. yeah, so, <clears throat> um, but uh, the Oviedo Gazette said, you know, they, they were outraged. It was, it was the, the, the headline, and, and the, the Wigos got was, was generally pro-slavery. <laughs> they were the democratic organ for, <laughs> uh, for the time, but, you know, they really stuck up for the, this black barber. They said, he's just as good as all these white people. In fact, he's a lot better. Ah. You know, he shouldn't be treated that way. Yeah. <laughs> so wow. it, it had to be an interesting case. Yeah. And then um, the other thing that's really significant uh, is that there was a, you know, in the, uh, once the Depression comes on, what, one of the, the things that FDR creates, which is just really one of the best programs, any government program, you know, regardless of whether it was the, the, the CCC or you know, all, all the other things that he did, uh, is Civilian Conservation Corps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, there was, um, uh, I kind of have to do some background on the bonus marchers, are you familiar with them? Mm -hmm. right. Okay, bonus marchers were World War I vets okay. that uh, were getting shortchanged. Mm -hmm. And so Congress was just stalling all through the 1920s. So they, they kind of gave up. You know, said, you know, we really need a bonus because, you know, we risked our life over in France. You know, and, you know we deserve a little extra. <clears throat> but it, it became kind of a political football and there's just so many times <clears throat> the government makes promises to veterans and then, it, and then, you know, well, let's see, well, we got other priorities. So the depression hits and the bonus marchers actually go to Washington and they say, all right, we know everybody's in trouble, but we still need something extra because, <clears throat> you know, the government needs to come through for us. It was a, a, you know, a, a major campaign issue for the 1932 uh, presidential campaign. So, <clears throat> and FDR still stalls, even though he, he used that as a campaign issue he, you know, that was kind of a black mark on the, the FDR legacy. But as far as, um, you know, the World War I vets were concerned, he said, all right, I'm not going to give you any money, but if you want to join the CCC Corps, which is for young men 18 to 25, we'll make camps for you. We'll, we'll put you to work. You'll have a place to stay, and you'll, you'll, you'll get a little bit of money. But, you know, at least you'll have a roof over your head. And so um, they were hoping to integrate these camps, but there was just so much resistance down south, they, they, they said it, it, it's not going to be worth it. So there was a black CCC camp 
for a World War I vets in Tioga County is in Straits Corners. Oh, yeah. Ran for three years. Um, they did, um, you know, a lot of remarkable work. They, they, they were one of the first camps in New York State to work on private property. They brought electricity to Straits Corners. They worked on the flood in 1936. Um, and so, uh, when they built, um, there's there's like a uh, an African American center in Ithaca. Hith yeah. <clears throat> I can't think of the name of it right now. Eleanor Roosevelt came and, and dedicated it, and uh, these World War One vets were part of the honor guard, so they brought them up from the camp, and so um, the you know, the Republicans criticized. All the government spending that was going on, including at CCC camps. <clears throat> says, oh, that super forester, FDR, you know, here he is throwing this money around. Uh, but after three years, when they closed the camp, even the local Republicans said, this is a good idea. We, mm -hmm. you know, we, we, we benefited from all the work that they did. Sort of like Social Security. Right. right. Exactly. Same, almost that same exact time. <clears throat> Republicans were mm -hmm. totally opposed to it. Some of the first to be in line to go in. The other um, uh, thing I want to mention is a guy by the name of William Billy Cheeks. Now, the black population was around 80 in um, the end of the Civil War. And it was... Um, it was about twice, it, the, the population doubled within about 10 years. You know, all these people coming up from, you know, emancipated, and that happened to just about every established black community in New York State. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> these guys were, and, and women, you know, hey, we, we, got, we got a chance to see the countryside, and if you had an established black community, you know, this gave, gave them a chance to get established. So. The Cheeks family, I think there was a couple of them, uh, and each family had about 12 kids. So, and then one family was especially musical. They said they would, they would do minstrel shows, mm. you'd see them on the street corners as quartets or sextets singing, and um, one fellow in particular uh, was especially musically gifted, and he was William Cheeks, and then around the turn of the century, he formed a quartet that went to Europe, mm. and he performed for the King and Queen of England, Kaiser Wilhelm. Mm. They, he actually went to the, you know the, to Russia, you know, formed in front of the Tsar. And then World War One hits, <clears throat> and um, after that, this whole courtly, you know, the the, the kingdoms are gone. And so that circuit kind of dissolves. And so um, Cheeks ends up in uh, present-day Indonesia. And so the first time I find out about him is 1938. There's, there's, there's an illegal businessman in uh, Batavia. You know, that was the, I, I'm not sure what the, what the name of it is now. And he comes across, you know, one of his... Um, colleagues from Uigo, he's waiting on tables. And you know, he was elderly by then, you know, he couldn't sing anymore, and so this is the way he was supporting himself. So he was, <clears throat> he was hoping he could find his way back to Uigo, and evidently the, the family wasn't in a, in a position where they could help him. So he dies, I think, within a year or two later. <clears throat> the write-up about him said that, um, he was one of the first prominent black musicians. He was the forerunner to Paul Roberson. Mm. You know, this, this man really had a lot of significance. <clears throat> it's one of these other dead ends. I've tried to find other references to him somewhere else. Mm. All I have is what was in the, um, you know, the Uigo newspapers. So the last thing I want to do, <clears throat> if you take your guide, is I want to show you <clears throat> page three, notes on the history of the Livermore Farm. <clears throat> so I, I went through the deed transactions, and um, the first Livermore is 1888, <clears throat> and then every five years, 
Amos deeds to Obadiah, Obadiah deeds to Rufus, Rufus deeds to Phineas, and then James Madison comes along in 1839, suddenly coming out of the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, Madison um, buys up a number, number of parcels, and he had one of the largest farms in Tioga County, and it was a, just a thriving operation. Mm. Uh, these are the ag statistics from 1875. <clears throat> 19 acres of oats, 12 acres of potatoes, 100 tons of hay, produced 6,000 pounds of butter, 44, milk, they call them milch cows, milk cows, 77 sheep, 200 apple trees. He was really producing. He was really producing. And uh, like I said, right after this period of time, all those commodities start to drop in price, and these hill farms, you know, just can't uh, compete anymore. So if you go over the page, <clears throat> uh, Liv James Livermore's son, um, he gets it in 1910, and then he sell sells to Merrill Mott in 1913. Merrill Mott dies in the flu, flu epidemic, yeah. and then somewhere in that period, the, the Livermore family from that grave they're, they're, re, they're exhumed and brought into uh, uh, down to North Valley. Then 1919, it's bought by a, a Bavarian immigrant, German, uh, by the name of Ambrose Hoffman. Okay. Now he buys a dairy farm not too far away in the town of Uigo. <clears throat> and uh, I actually talked to his son, you know, before he passed away. And... Um, hmm. He had been what a, a lot of farmers uh, and other people, they'll, they'll make mistakes uh, as far as trying to read into the future. Now, in wartime, commodity prices go up, yeah. you know, because you've got to feed the army. And so um, Ambrose Hoffman had been, I think, in the North, uh, South Dakota, North Dakota, and, uh, oh yeah, South Dakota. So he had raised beef cattle out there and had done quite well. Though. He bought the Livermore farm okay. to raise beef. Okay. And then as soon as he bought it, you know, commodity prices dropped. And so um, what his son said that, you know, the, the farm just barely paid for itself, you know, because the price of beef just, you know, had, had, had dropped so much. So that was when? About 19... He, he bought it in 1919, so... He had, and then he, uh, Ambrose, the elder, he dies in 1926, so it was the, the children and the wife that had to take over the farm. And then the depression hits. <clears throat> and um, so New York State buys the, the liver, what they call the Livermore Farm, and mm -hmm. they buy the Oakley Farm, because they'd like to have a about a thousand acres for it to create a state forest. Mm -hmm. And they paid 352 an acre. And um, uh, there were buildings on the farm, but they knew that people would move in or there'd be, you know, vagrants, vagrants uh, or people would just set fires and that type of thing. So the buildings got sold off. I know one of the things when I was talking to five, my father's contemporaries, he said, that was a great place for blueberries. Mm -hmm. oh, but that's, that's one of the things that moves in, you know, as farmland is transitioning to... Uh, you know, to, uh, to to forest is that blueberries are coming in, and berries of all all kinds of different sorts. So, okay, can I interject something here? Yes. Uh, during that time period, you know, uh, the reason, one of the other reasons that a lot of farms fell came with, was not only the depression, but that's when they it was the tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. They went in and they just slaughtered cows mm -hmm. because they had oh. TB. And, and so that devastated the economic value. Yeah, of the oh, that, that hurt too. Yeah, yeah. And that, so that, you know, I know my grandfather had a farm not too far from here. And they went in and just, you know, opened the ditch, killed them all, yeah. and yeah. them, and that's it. And mm -hmm. so how do you survive with all your cows? Yeah. You know, right, and right. the depression and everything else. Yeah. Uh -huh. It uh, makes sense. Mm -hmm. That's why there were so many vacant farms in the 1930s. But they were, they were run down, oh, yeah. in a bit, you know, as, as, as soon as you get into the 1880s, um, oh, there, was, there was this other notice that um, uh, you know the, the farmers aren't uh, 
trimming the, the, the roadsides anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just not worth it. <clears throat> and then people are, are noting that, you know, there's, uh, there's abandoned farmland. And like I said, yeah. by the 18, 1890s, you know, there's reports of farms that are just being abandoned. Sure. You know, yeah. and then all the, the mammals that had been exterminated you know, white-tailed deer, bear, um, uh, beavers, they, they, they start to show up in the early part of the 20th century. So that, that's another environmental thing that, you know, is just really fascinating. Was it planted by the CCC? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that was, a, mm -hmm. you know, they, they came over there and they, plant, they came and planted, uh, you know, red pine. And I think there, there's some other spruce that are over there in the Oakley Corners as well. Red is probably white pine. Well, mm -hmm. white pine is native, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. is native, so probably red pine. Yeah, the, the white pine pretty much, I think, showed up on its own. Right, that's a native mm -hmm. tree. Mm -hmm. And there were apple orchards up there, too. What's that? There was apple orchards up there. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they, I think there's still some remnants of the apple trees that are there. Yeah. And then you'll see hemlocks in particular, where there's a ravine because um, mm -hmm. hemlocks like water, and they'll also grow in the shade. And so, um, so um, I, 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 I'll try to contact all of you. I, I would rather not go out today because it's still kind of pretty miserable. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. um, so what the, yeah, you gotta, you gotta leave. Yeah, I have to go. Yeah, I'm just kind of curious.